and we'll try to answer that. And of course, let, let's make this, uh, you know, meet up as usual fun uh, so that, uh, you know, the, uh, we can also learn uh, w without any stress and concern about, you know, specific questions. So with, without further ado, I'll give uh, Joseph the uh, floor so that he can talk about uh, Ansible updates. Up to you, Joseph. Thanks for that, Michael. I love it when you say no stress, learning with no stress, just enjoying it, right? So uh, good day and good afternoon, everyone. Hello, Ansibles. I'll be uh, giving some updates on the latest with Ansible. I'll make this one uh, brief so we have more time for Ansible on Windows goodness with Anthony. But I'll share additional links and resources that you can go through after the meetup. If you have grabbed the Q&A box, and the team will help answer them for you. All right, so just a quick refresher, right? Ansible automation platform was first introduced during Ansible Fest of last year, this shirt I'm wearing. And here's a list of the features and services that uh, was announced with it. There are, these are all included with what you already get. First, of course, the Ansible engine, Ansible tower, automation analytics, automation hub, uh, supported contents and a whole lot more. But for us to have a better idea on how it all stacked together, let's have a look at this uh, diagram, right? So wait. So this diagram gives us a better view automation platform. So at the bottom, good old Ansible engine is of course the main language that gives us the ability to create and write automation codes. On top of that, Ansible Tower then gives us the flexibility to scale uh, our control and our operations. On top of those are our Ansible platform service offerings. What this allows us to do is that it allows us to engage users efficiently and make the most out of the automation that we're developing. So today I'll be sharing the latest on some of these components or some services catalog which uh, GA last May 28th of this year. All right, so simply put, service catalog is your online retail store of all the goodness of the automation workflows you've developed in Ansible. So it is a good way of selling all the hidden automation workflows that you got there. Uh, it delivers uh, built automation to both the developer and the business user with services that they can order, just like ordering, you know, stuff online. Uh, what it does, it makes it very easy to consume, right? Therefore, it encourages more usage across our organization. You know how, for example, a systems admin develop a very good automation on some of the uh, mundane tasks that it's doing, but it's kept there. No one knows about it because it's hard to consume or probably it's, it's just there. It's just not in the open. So, but all this goodness, important uh, aspect of it as well is delivering governance, right? So we wanted to have proper governance of automation services across your enterprise. It also supplies the necessary controls. It's important. So uh, it is required by the business, you know, they, they wanted to track how this automation is being used, the capacity, the expenses, and all that. All right, so to give you a better idea, here's a uh, quick demo of service catalog. Oh, it plays. So in this example, I am a user with request access only. I am presented with the specific products that I can order. These products can also be grouped into what we call portfolios. So we can have more organized access to specific set of things. And then, this and then the what you call the platforms represent the tower clusters where the requests will be executed so these are your tower clusters i can also see my order history just like when you go shopping for goodies online and finally the status of my orders all the approvals and whatnot as you can see in, in this uh, sample os portfolio i can request windows server for example you can also have a portfolio of other services such as databases, web servers, Java application servers. It can range from a single server to an entire application stack. So let's go over a RHEL operating, RHEL 8 operating system. So let's click the order button. 
The drop-down menus you see here are all related to the tower surveys for that workflow. Remember, service from towers, right? So, okay, let's order a RHEL 8 container with one gig of CPU and a gig of memory. Let's hit submit, and let's check the status of our order. As you see here, it's still approval pending. And if we click on that, we can say we can see that the status has been ordered actually and all the other order details. Approval, it has been auto approved by the system. So there's a facility for you to like, oh, this is probably too simple. I'll just have it auto approved. So that's a quick demo of uh, the service catalog. As I've said, you can probably do small scale requests on your sandpit environment with auto approvals, right? So this will bypass hideous queues and processes just for a developer to access some resources. For those small ones, that's auto approved, that's all right. But there are other forms of governance apart from auto approval. No, there will be requests that requires more strict authorization to protect your critical environments, your production environment, for example. You don't want those auto approved, right? We also want to ensure uh, our capacity, our resources and expenses are properly maintained through proper governance. And of course, we can have more time developing and publishing contents for our users. How? By eliminating a necessary process on some of the requests through role-based role access. And finally, business control. I think it's quite important that we align with the business. For example, I'm, a, I'm an OpenShift product owner. I make sure that all the namespaces are within my scope. Or if I'm a cloud, Azure, AWS, or Google Cloud product owner, for example, I want to have control of my own uh, product base, right? Sweet. So personas with uh, automation services catalog. For example, I'm a business user. I will have access to my service catalog of containers, VMs, OpenShift projects, and other services among others. I will self-manage for myself using the catalog instead of going through some painful process and probably disturbing managers for approvals and whatnot. And if I'm the automation admin, instead of me executing your build requirements on Tower, I can delegate that. I can delegate this to be automated on the service catalog. Why? So I can focus more on a value adding goodness. I can develop more automation for you to consume. And if I'm on IT operations, I'm an SRE, for example, I can have better control over my platforms, better control yet properly govern changes to approvals. So these are all the advantages for uh, different personas in our organization. So wait, so next up, we have the automation content, content help. It was first announced on, again, Red Hat Ansible Fest last year. So just a quick review, a collection is a strict project directory structure for Ansible content, right? It is similar to the directory, to the role directory structure. So what this content collection provides is a continuously updated set of a curated automation content, pre-built, packaged, certified, and tested. Why? So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? If it's there, then it's there for us to consume. So this helps us shorten the time to value and um, improve the efficiency of, you know, maintaining, writing, and consuming automation with, of course, um, the ability to reuse Ansible content at a scale. The good thing about it as well is that there will be blogs for each collection, and this will be supported. This will be supported by Red Hat subscriptions, meaning you can actually log a case against this uh, collection. So uh, just uh, last month, June 28, I think, Red Hat published 17 new collections that are all written and supported by Red Hat. So that brings our overall total to 49 certified collections up to date. So collections are available for many popular network, security, and cloud partners. That includes the likes of AWS, Arista, and Cisco, IBM, Juniper, Plunk, and uh, BYOS platforms, and a whole ton more. There are collections for other Red Hat products themselves, like a good example would be Satellite. 
So we have an entire collection for satellite, wherein um, that collection gives you the ability to automate the build and operations of satellite, everything on that collection alone. So that gives us greater confidence with automation, knowing that, as I've said, it has been tested and it is backed by Red Hat and now our partners. The good thing about it is it as well is that the collections are published asynchronously from Ansible releases, meaning it's easy to access them as they become available. So a full list is available at uh, cloud.redhat.com, just as you see here all those uh, content um, collections. And this is actually what it looks like, for example, for Azure. So you have the installation command. You can also download it as a tarball and all the other details. It's fully documented. Each of every module is fully documented how to use it and also um, the other details about it. So, yeah. so, next up. Ansible Tower 3.7. Okay, so the focus of 3.7 release is more on scalability of automation and um, improving the experience of our users, meaning it's way faster, it's way more efficient, right? And I would say you will probably notice that uh, there's not a lot of new features just yet because a larger platform release will be coming at the end of the year. So watch out for that. And apologies, I won't be able to dig uh, deep into the details as we have limited time, but do please have a look on these uh, links if you want more details on the release notes of Ansible Tower 3.7. Okay, blocking of jobs. For some of you, this is a familiar scenario wherein any job that required a project or inventory update would have that update block on any job using that project or inventory to finish. And now with 3.7, no more blocking. So the project or inventory update will proceed first and then the jobs will run. And then speaking about scale. So this um, information is based on specific benchmark of a number of jobs and uh, what not. So for example, task manager processing for a sample of 5,000 jobs from 200 seconds down to under 10. That's quite a lot. That's quite a scale, right? And simply querying unified jobs for a sample set of 1 million jobs from three to four seconds to 300 milliseconds and loading the first page of job events with 1 million sample events from two seconds to uh, three tenths of a second. We also tried a sample deletion of 1 million jobs with cleanup jobs, outstanding six minutes from seven hours. So that's, that's quite a lot of improvement in the performance right there. And of course, automation wants us to work smarter, not harder, right? So with that, we drastically reduce API requests in the user interface for Tower. Uh, we did that by utilizing enhanced WebSocket data. So we no longer refresh job lists when new jobs are starting. And also a Tower that was unusable with new jobs per second is now responsive even under load by many jobs and many clients. We also removed inventory computed fields, which allowed us to, uh, which allowed jobs to finish shaving um, much, much faster. I'm we still have a few minutes, so, hi. I'm check. So just, just to check, uh, sorry, just to have a, a glimpse of automation analytics. So if you're familiar with Red Hat Insights, this is kind of similar to that. It gives you a good overall view and health of your tower clusters with notifications. There's even an ROI calculator. You know, we know, we want to know how much we are saving with our automation. So, yeah, all this information, um, you can have a look on the uh, Ansible blogs and uh, you can have a read, uh, a further read on all the Ansible goodness uh, that we have. So that ends Ansible updates. So I'll flick it over automation with Windows. Thanks, Joseph. Um, yeah, Anthony, you can now uh, share your screen so that uh, other people can see it as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, 
Guys, uh, let me know if you can see my screen. I guess sharing. Yes, we can see. Okay. It. All right. So I'm going to share. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the session. Um, we are going to talk about um, the Ansible Windows automation piece um, for the next hour or so. Right. Um, feel free to drop any questions that you have in the chat, and uh, we'll be happy to um, answer them. Right. Um, okay. I'm going to proceed. So the Ansible um, Windows module itself, right? We have about uh, more than a hundred at this point in time, and that um, we actually can uh, make use of the uh, thousand three hundred plus PowerShell. Uh, DSC uh, resources as well to augment or complement uh, whatever that uh, we have in uh, the uh, Windows module uh, at this point in time, right? So uh, we can actually do quite a lot of stuff uh, when you start to look at the community contribution to the DSC site uh, from the Windows um, house, right? So it's not just the uh, Ansible modules that we have, but uh, we can also work alongside with whatever that has been contributed uh, by the Windows community um, contributors. Right, in the form of a desired state uh, configuration um, resources, right? So we do, we do have those kind of uh, modules that works uh, alongside with it. Um, if you want to find more information, right, uh, feel free to visit the uh, ansible.com right slash windows to get uh, more info and details with regards to the different uh, modules that we have. So how does it actually work? <coughs> Excuse me. So um, we are really using a WinRM to connect to the Windows uh, machine, right? Um, this is the way that um, is kind of natively supported out of the box uh, for um, actually from a Windows 2016 server onwards, right? So uh, WinRM, it's uh, enabled. Um, for 2012 and below, right, you have to set up the listener and uh, make sure that you can actually uh, connect uh, via WinRM. So, um, there is PSRP support since uh, Ansible Engine 2.7. Right now we are at Engine uh, 2.9.10, right? Um, and we will use, um, I mean, you will be able to help us to do things like file transfer as well as, uh, you know, you'll be faster and much better, right, in terms of connections. So there is this thing on uh, the Microsoft um, Open SSH. <clears throat> we know that from the Windows Server 2019 onwards, this is actually enabled by default. Right, so um, PowerShell itself, it's very similar to the concept of uh, us managing the Linux or the, um, you know, the other equipment, right, um, using Python, right? So PowerShell exists out of the box uh, in all the Windows um, server that we are talking about. So we will need at least uh, PowerShell 3.0, uh, .NET uh, 4.0, right, uh, to manage all these uh, servers, right, from Windows uh, side of the house. And uh, we do know that um, from Windows um, 2012 R2 onwards, basically all these are already um, satisfied out of the box. If you are running on 2008 Windows, uh, then you will need to um, make sure that the PowerShell 2.0, which is the default, is uh, upgraded to 3.0 before you can actually uh, use all the available uh, Windows Ansible modules to manage your end target uh, system, right? So um, pretty much most of our customers today, they don't really have to do much in order to be able to use um, Ansible to manage their end target. Since uh, I think we do know or uh, aware that uh, the 20, 000, uh, 2008 uh, server Windows, right? It's a kind of end of support, right? Since the starting of this year. So unless you are on extended support, what we are seeing in the market um, today is that most of our customers are actually uh, migrating or upgrading their service uh, to either 2012 or 2016. We have some on 2019, uh, then um, those obviously we, we do not have to worry too much uh, when it comes to all this uh, minimum requirement. Uh, inventory wise, uh, it's basically a way that uh, we store the information with regards to um, the servers that we have in the environment. But right? we um, have all this information stored in the uh, Ansible inventory. Uh, we can 
basically use the concept of uh, either a static or dynamic inventory, right? Uh, it's similar as well to how we manage other target uh, platform. We can pull the information uh, from a source uh, such as the uh, VMware vCenter, or we can pull from um, the um, cloud, right? Like uh, AWS or Microsoft Azure. Basically, this will allow us to populate our inventory with a single source of truth, right? And then uh, we will just make use of the information inside the inventory to go and connect to our target uh, Windows um, server via uh, WinRM. Um, of course, in future, uh, we will be also looking at things like uh, maybe using OpenSSH, right, to go and connect to all these systems uh, once um, it is prevalent in the newer release of uh, Windows. So this is an example, right, on how the um, inventory can look like. Uh, you can see that uh, this is a typical INI uh, file format that we have. Right, we have basically defined a group uh, for Windows and that uh, we have the IS um, server as well as the MS SQL server uh, park under this uh, particular uh, grouping for Windows. Uh, we have the concept of uh, variables. Those are the stuff that uh, specifically um, uh, be, been used for all this uh, Windows grouping. Right? As you can see over here that uh, we are basically specifying that we will use uh, Win RM uh, as the connection type to talk to all these um, servers. So for the um, authentication or transport from that kind of layer, we are looking at things like um, NTLM or Kerberos or CRED SSP, right, to go and talk to all these uh, different um, servers. Um, I think uh, most of our customers are using Kerberos um, today to do the uh, authentication. So what can we do, right? We can do things like running commands and scripts. Uh, as you can see over here, we basically can make use of um, command uh, module. Uh, we call that the uh, the win command module, right? It will be able to um, execute a command remotely on the uh, group of uh, Windows servers that uh, we want to target. So uh, from that sense, right, there is no real item potency uh, because we are just uh, issuing the command and after that uh, we are just uh, assuming that this thing is uh, being done, right? So if we rerun it again, it will just run the same command. Right? It's different from using uh, Ansible modules which are able to identify that the end state has been uh, reached and hence uh, you do not need to execute this particular task, right? Uh, in the case of commands, we are just running it and uh, fire and forget. Right, so this is how you can actually run a command, uh, a CMD command, right? In this case, we are doing um, just a creation of um, a temp drive, right? So this is similar to how you would do things uh, using PowerShell. Uh, there isn't too much of a difference. Uh, what you can see here is that we are just using it to um, run a uh, PowerShell command, right? Um, you can also execute, um, you know, like a, a script, right? Um, or that you can say that, you know, um, change to some directory uh, create a backup directory, right, as uh, part of the arguments. And after that, uh, we will be able to uh, run that particular command um, as well, right? So um, just like what it is mentioned in the um, the name of the task, right, we are running from a specific folder and we skip when the conditions are satisfied, right? So those are the stuff that uh, we, we can do uh, quite easily out of the box. Not very different from how a normal Windows administrator are doing things. Um, so this is the Windows uh, shell. It's uh, similar to command, right? It's just that uh, it's not as secure because you can, um, you know, do piping and all those stuff, right? So um, the you can do multi-line scripts, for instance, right? Like in this case, uh, we can specify uh, the value that we want to pass in, and after that, uh, use the things like if else um, statement to. Uh, run the particular action that you want it to be, right? So um, you can also call things like new item, right? Just to create all this stuff. Uh, scripts, script is something that uh, can be used on both the Linux and uh, Windows, right? So it's a module that we have. It actually allows uh, the user to transfer and execute a script, right? So you can have something that exists uh, in, uh, for instance, uh, 
GitHub or GitLab, right? And then you transfer and execute the script uh, locally on the uh, system, right? So um, as mentioned over here, right, we should use it when the other modules um, doesn't work uh, because we are very concerned about things like item potency. We just want to make sure that uh, we can use modules that is actually aware of the uh, state, uh, the end desired state that we want it to be in, right? Uh, as opposed to just, uh, you know, um, cop, uh, running a, a module that will just execute a script. So how the script works, uh, the script module works is very simple, right? We're just saying that, okay, um, get this and just go and execute this uh, on the remote server. So when it comes to um, software uh, management, right, we can do things like uh, application uh, installation, right? These are some of the um, modules that we have out of the box, right? We have the uh, the Win package uh, modules, right? For instance, it can allow you to install a .dot uh, msi or .dot exe uh, file. The uh, the Win feature, for instance, right, allows you to um, install uh, the features on the um, Windows servers, right? As mentioned over here, Win updates, we can install specific um, KBs, um, allows you to do things from certain catalog and blacklist. So I will show uh, this as part of the um, video demo later on, on how um, the Win update uh, module can actually be used uh, in our situation, right? Then um, we can also use the uh, Win hotfix to install or remove uh, the hotfixes uh, on the Windows uh, target server. So um, this is one of the uh, example, right, on how we can um, run um, the installation of Visual C, right, using um, the Win package. So we can specify the path, right, that uh, we are going to download the exe file, uh, the product ID, and after that, the argument that we are passing in, right, install passive, uh, no restart. So those are the stuff that uh, we're going to pass in uh, to be able to uh, install this particular package and that we will specify things like where to download. Right, so we can quite easily do this um, on a large number of systems, um, just like what uh, Mike was telling you guys earlier. Right, we, we can use this to manage hundreds or thousands of uh, Windows machines at the same time. Um, Ansible is capable of running the processes in parallel. So we can basically um, do this um, over a large number of different servers uh, at the same time, and uh, we'll help you to ensure consistencies of the state um, throughout. So this is another way of using Win feature. Uh, basically, we use it to uh, install the IS uh, web server, right? We ensure that the state is uh, present. So um, if you are familiar with Ansible, you know that uh, we are really uh, concerned about the desired state, right? So we can specify the state as uh, whether is it present or absent, right? Just to uh, decide whether or not we should install or uninstall the particular feature. So this is uh, options to allow you to include uh, things like sub features as well as the management tools. If you were to include this, then it will help you to automatically install as well. So those are some of the, the parameters that is uh, available within Win feature that you can use to, uh, you know, uh, do the installation. Uh, Win updates, uh, we roughly talk about that. So um, starting from Ansible Engine 2.5, you can actually perform um, a transparent system and uh, updates as well as the auto reboot. So what can happen? then is that uh, you can say that I want to install this kind of packages and then get the system to auto reboot. So this is actually quite important for some of our customers. Uh, why? Because I think, um, I'm not sure whether it is the case for you guys, but uh, we do have customers who are doing manual rebooting after all these um, updates that happens in the Windows machine. Because unlike uh, Linux systems, right, they usually have to go through multiple updates for different patches. Uh, when you start to patch your Windows uh, machine. So a lot of people, I mean, some customers, right, they are actually monitoring that whole process and that kind of slows down the speed in which they can patch their system because what will happen is that you can only do so much uh, a night, right, when you have a guy that goes around clicking on the button to do a manual reboot. So, and they're monitoring whatever that's going on. So they 
were very happy, right, when they were able to see that they have things like uh, Ansible that can actually help them to do patch uh, management as well as um, do an auto reboot uh, of the system whenever there is a need until the all the required uh, updates are fully uh, installed, right? So those are the stuff that uh, they see value in, right? So um, of course, other than that, they were also using Windows for, I mean, uh, Ansible for other Windows uh, related tasks like um, the uh, hardening compliance, right? So it can all come in. Uh, we don't really, uh, you know, care how many kind of uh, activities or the stuff that you're doing on the end target system, right? Um, basically, um, that's how Ansible can be used. Um, so I'll just run a very simple demo, right? I mean, uh, just to show you guys uh, how, how it works. Um, there are a few things, right? So I have done this uh, in my home environment. I am using the uh, Windows uh, 2016 uh, server. So over here, you can see that uh, I, I, have, I will have um, two servers inside my environment on different uh, IP subnets, right? So this guy is on 100.157. And then um, you have another one that is on um, the .200.100 IP. So what we are trying to do at this uh, point in time is trying to generate a list of uh, um, updates right basically i want to know what are the missing uh, kbs inside the uh, two servers right so then um after this we will perform the uh, updates so i'm just going to run the video so over here i have my gmail account um i'm going to send uh the information right as an email attachment to myself i'm coming in as the windows uh, engineer right so um this is my I think you guys might also be familiar, right? In case you are not uh, quite familiar with the uh, interface of uh, Ansible, this is uh, the project um, um, tab, right? You will be able to see that uh, we are pointing to a source code management URL. In this case, I'm pointing to my own uh, Git repository. Uh, I'm requesting that it goes there and pick up the playbooks that I have already checked in, right? And then use it to um, do the task that we are looking for. Right? You can do things like update revision on launch, which is uh, similar to a git pool. Right? When you clean, you just uh, delete uh, the stuff that you already have. So you should at least uh, make sure that it does a git pool every time, right? just to make sure that your uh, playbooks are latest and greatest. So different groupings that we have, we see over here that we have the Windows AD, uh, I have a 2012 uh, group, and I have a 2016 group. The host, right? Um, this is the the two hundred dot hundred um IP address, right? That is one of the hosts that we will be working on. Um, the connection that we have, we were saying that we are using WinRM. The port five nine eighty six. Uh, basically, we are doing this over HTTPS, right? You can do uh HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, HTTP is five nine eighty five, but uh, for customers that we are dealing with, it's going to be five nine eighty six. Uh for the most part, uh, because it's just my own uh, local server, right? So I'm just ignoring um, the certificate validation. Uh, transport, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, there are the uh, basic NTLM, Cred SSP, and uh, Kerberos. Um, of course, we don't use the uh, basic because uh, it's not encrypted, right? It's clear text. So you will see in most cases, I think in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the customers are using Kerberos, right? In my example, I am using um, Cred SSP. Um, I mean, it's also encrypted. So this is the other host that I have, the 100.157 IP uh, address, right? So this is the one in the other subnet. If we were to go back to the dashboard, what can happen is that we will look at the list of uh, templates that we have, right? We ought to filter them, right? What I have is that I'm going to check for the uh, Windows update. Uh, you can see the credentials that I'm passing in, right? These are the credentials that we will use to access our um, Windows servers. Uh, I have a vault, uh, Ansible vault, right, for um, encrypting my uh, credential files for Gmail. So I'm keying in the group of um, servers that uh, 
we will be uh, targeting. Uh, these are the catalogs. Um, for the guys who are familiar with uh, Windows, you, you will know that uh, there are a list of uh, catalogs that you can actually uh, select from. So uh, over here, I want to check for the updates which are uh, needed, right? When it comes to the categories for critical updates, or uh, definition updates, you know, the security updates and the uh, update rollups. So the next tab, right? Uh, the survey, the survey will, the Ansible survey form will basically allow you to confirm, right? These are all the extra vars that you're going to pass in. And when you launch it, it's going to, um, obviously, the first thing that it does is it's going to do a task code management update. And after this, it's, it's going to go and search and return a list of uh, updates um, on whatever that we are missing uh, within the system itself. And what I was doing over here is I'm compiling a report uh, that I sent as an attachment, right? HTML uh, file format um, to um, myself. Right, so you can see that uh, we are missing this uh, KBs, right? Based on based on this, and if you actually were to go back to the Windows um, servers, you can see that it's the same uh, definition that uh, it's whatever that's showing inside the Windows server is whatever that we have actually pulled back. So this is also one of those things that is kind of important when you have a large number of um, servers that you have to deal with, right? Because I can quite easily pull out all those things uh, that is needed um, for you. So how we usually work is with the uh, Windows WSUS. Um, so we can uh, have the WSUS stores all the required uh, packages and repositories. And then uh, Ansible will work with it to go and help you with the uh, patch uh, management. So the next thing that can happen after this, of course, is that uh, we will uh, perform specific updates, right? So over here, you can see that those are the, the stuff that we are uh, missing and that we need to be updated. So these two KBs are basically the same across the two systems, right? So I'm going to skip through the front part. We will again go in as the uh, Windows engineer, right? Then uh, what will happen is that this time around, we are going to install the Windows update. So we will see a different um, survey form, right? So again, I am going to select the uh, 2016 Windows, and then I'm going to do a drop down. I mean, in case. So these are the ones that I'm that I was uh, referring to, right? These are all the different categories. Uh, we can create them as a drop down list that the uh, engineer can select um, on the categories that they are interested in. And uh, over here, we are listing a uh, whitelist and blacklist uh, option, right? So whitelist uh, basically are the stuff that we say that we will install. Um, because this is just a demo, right? So I'm just going to put uh, one of the KBs inside. Of course, in the real environment, uh, you will have large numbers and um, you can decide for yourself what are the stuff that uh, you want updates. If you decide that there are certain uh, KBs that you do not want to update, then you can specify under the blacklist so that you will uh, update everything else other than the stuff inside the blacklist. Uh, because again, I'm doing a demo. If I do an auto reboot, I will. It will be hard for me to um, keep track of whatever that's going on. So my uh, auto reboot is uh, set to no. Uh, but in most customers' environment, uh, you will see that it is going to be an auto reboot, unless uh, you are in. I mean, as in there are certain customers who doesn't want to do that because. Um, they want to do some patching during the daytime and reboot during the night. So there are different kind of situations depending on your strategies. Um, you have the option and the flexibility when you start to use uh, the Win Update modules uh, in Ansible, right, to do all those things. So these are the categories and the KBs that uh, we are going to patch. So if you hit launch, right, it will just uh, start um, running the uh, updates. So I will go back to the Windows servers. I just wanted to show you that the processes, excuse me, the task manager, right? You can see that um, 
the CPU is spiking, right? After we started the workflow, if you look at it, the Windows module installer is running uh, in the background. So all those things are all triggered uh, by Ansible. Uh, if you were to go back to the other one, you can see, yeah, it's 76 and drop down. Well, that's that's because the KV has been installed, right? So similar things. So if you go back to Windows, I mean uh, Ansible, you will see that it shows that uh, both the um, Windows servers have been patched. If you were to um, Of course, I mean, I'm just trying to show again right, that um, everything is back to normal. So you see over here that it actually detects that this thing has been um, installed. This is exactly what we put in, and that it says that it requires a restart to finish uh, installing. So as what I mentioned earlier, because I'm doing a demo, right? So um, I didn't do an auto restart, but in normal circumstances, you don't have to come here and check all these things. It will just uh, reboot and uh, you know, you will come back. Uh, if there is a lot of things to be patched, you will also do multiple reboots along the way just to make sure that all the stuff that you requested for will all get uh, updated. Okay. So um, of course, I'm going to skip through all this. And then towards the very end, um, after the reboot, uh, we check that the this is being ping, right? We after the reboot, we check that everything is back to normal. All this can be modeled as a workflow, right? So we have the workflow capabilities within Ansible Tower. It allows you to do this like a single flow. Right? After the reboot, what do you want to do? Things like pre-health checks, post post uh, health checks can all be done as part of that workflow. And um, we will again come back here to to run the checks right so this time around we are just going to um, do a scan again uh, just to make sure that uh, whatever that we have done um, from you know Ansible previously uh, is actually working so I'm just going to do a scan again um, and that this time around let me just you get another new email notification that says that um, You are down to uh, one KB, right? Just now we started with two, and now we have one, right? So that is in a way showing that you know we have managed to patch it. We can you know generate a simple report just for ourselves, just to keep track of whatever that's going on, right? So that is one of those things that we can quite easily do when it comes to uh, using Ansible to manage all these uh, systems. So this is for the updates. I am going to continue on. Um, so let me just continue to present on the slides. Uh, under the hood, this is what we are doing, right? Basically, nothing special, right? Starting from 2.5, we have this auto reboot feature. We we have these uh, things to blacklist. What I'm passing in is available. Uh, the extra bars that is coming in from the user input. Um, similar to what this is doing uh, based on the demo earlier. Uh, we can also do things like uh, win reboot, right? We, we basically can say that, okay, uh, reboot the uh, Windows machine and uh, check whether or not it comes back, right? Sometimes you, you, you want to do something like that. Let's say the system is very slow and that you want to just uh, do a very simple action like reboot on the system. So you can also do it from Ansible, right? Ansible will uh, help you to do a reboot, and after that, uh, what will happen is it will check whether the WinRM connectivity is back. Once the WinRM connectivity is re-established, it will say that the reboot has uh, finished. All right, so um, yeah, this is the wait for connection piece, right? Uh, just to check whether it comes back. Um, okay, this this is uh something else that is it can be quite interesting, right? Which is that whether or not you need a reboot. Sometimes when you do things like getting the uh, system to um, join the uh, Windows uh, domain uh, during the initial stage of uh, provisioning, uh, you will need to be able to reboot the system so that it is able to uh, successfully join the domain. So those kind of things, uh, we can get um, the, the results by putting into register. Uh, and after that, we can check whether or not it requires a reboot based on the uh, info that comes back. If there is a need to reboot, then we make use of the when condition, right? To go and reboot the systems uh, 
after that. So this is going to make it much easier for us to be able to uh, determine when and when not uh, to reboot. Right. So that is something that we offer as well from uh, Ansible. Um, the default timing uh, is actually about 10 minutes, right? So we, we have this uh, way to uh, reboot a slow machine that may have a lot of updates or that it is just old, right? We, we know that there are customers who have very old systems out there in their environment that uh, may be hard to manage. Uh, we actually have customers coming to us, even though they have Windows SSCM, right? They are looking at how they can manage all those old systems and machines that are not part of the domain because of whatever reasons, they just couldn't get it to join the domain. And they were looking at how they can augment uh, Windows SSCM with uh, Ansible, right? So Ansible can help to talk to all those systems that uh, cannot really be managed by SSCM. And then we can help them to do things like, you know, config management or, you know, things like uh, Windows updates, right? So um, those are the things. Um, you can specify the shutdown timeout and the reboot timeout uh, in this case, right, to uh, 3,600, um, which is an hour. Um, there are other different modules available, right? In this case, uh, we talk about modules for managing the websites, um, you know, the IIS, uh, for instance. Um, over here, we basically say that this is the uh, default web uh, site and that we specify the um, physical path. If you want to manage your web app, you can also um, specify the parameters with the relevant uh, values uh, input inside. Um, the registry, right? So um, we are able to manage the value of the Windows uh, registry key, right? So by using uh, this uh, particular module that we have here. Um, this is kind of important, right, for us to be able to do uh, Windows hardening, for instance, uh, which I will show later on in a very short uh, demo video. What can happen, right, is uh, how we can basically um, use uh, the um, module, right, to check the value of the key uh, value, right, that is inside this uh, particular uh, virtual machine, uh, the Windows servers to see whether or not it is in compliance uh, with the standards that we need it to be. Uh, for instance, uh, the Windows uh, CIS, which is a quite uh, common standards uh, that uh, other customers are using, right? So if it is not in compliance, right, based on the check results, we can update the value, right? So it will help us to gain uh, compliance of all those uh, different servers. Um, for instance, like over here, right, we can say that we want to change the value just by using the, uh, uh, the Windows registry uh, added uh, module, right? Uh, and then we can merge the registry data as well if you want to. So I will I will just um, go through that uh, very short demo video as well. So as you can imagine, I am doing something similar, right? As what we did just now with the uh, updates. I'm basically using um, a CSV file format uh, this time around. Um, some of those, I mean, it's more of a preference, right? I have customers uh, telling me that they need a CSV file because they have other tools that can actually uh, read uh, CSV uh, much easier, right? So HTML may not be what they need. So we can see over here that uh, we have um, the sections. We have the password section, we have the account lockout section, and these are the different uh, keys that we are checking. And the results over here is that only two are successful, the rest are all failing. Uh, we have an expected setting and a current setting. So this can be done by Ansible to generate this kind of uh, simple report for this particular server, right? So um, what we will do after this, of course, is that uh, we will go back um, to Windows, I mean to Ansible, right? To um, look at the um, hardening uh, template that we have. So these are the stuff that uh, we have for this particular um, compliance hardening um, template. We are basically stating over here that we want to remediate the password and the account locked out um, session. This is a custom uh, hardening standards that uh, we have done as part of a POC for a customer, right? And this is really based out of uh, CIS. Um, so this is just a part of the whole standards. I mean, of course we can do everything, but 
demo wise, usually we just uh, pull out a few sections that we will work on. So um, we'll hit the next button, right? You we'll launch it. So it runs through the section that we have defined inside the uh, playbook on what are the stuff that it will do, right? And then it will start to change all the settings uh, accordingly uh, based on what we have defined uh, inside the system. Um, I was basically using a YAML file that has all the different um, configurations defined, right? On what is the base um, standards. You can see over here, right? That if you were to come to the Windows server, um, this was the value initially, right? So the net account command was executed. We can see that um, the minimum password age uh, was uh, zero days, and this was uh, the max was uh, 42, right? So based on the standards, we want to change it to 198 and all the other values that we have changed. So you can see that after running the particular uh, playbooks, uh, you can actually change all these values to the desired uh, value. The same thing can be seen uh, over here with the uh, password expiry uh, warning. When you come into the registry editor, it's five. If you refresh, it becomes uh, 14, which was the desired value that we want it to be. All right, so similar things I'm showing on the second server. We just wanted to show that we can do it across multiple servers at the same time. All right, so five, it will change to 14. So we will just run another scan just to get a new report on these two sections that we have. And then we will send an email with the audit uh, files. All right, so if you were to go back, you can see that you get a new mail that comes in. And then after that, uh, when you click on it, you will see that um, it becomes all successful, right? So this is for the first uh, server. You can check for the second server. It's uh, all successful as well. So basically, um, this, this could be one way in which you want to you know, manage the um, the way that you want to do it, right? I mean, there, there are different ways, but this is what uh, we were showing one of our customers uh, when they requested for us to, to demo that, you know, you can actually uh, check and do the hardening uh, on all these uh, different Windows machines as per the requirement. And usually it's slightly customized. It could be running both CIS level one hardening uh, and you have um, something else after that. All right, these are the Win service. So it's very similar to the uh, Linux um, service. Uh, you can decide what are the services that you want it to run. Right, you can say state as running, absent, or you know restarted. Right, so all those are the ways in which you can basically define uh, how you want this service to behave or to be like uh, eventually. Right, so um, this is for uh, things like the uh, firewall service. You want to make sure that it is stopped. Um, the start mode is uh, disabled, right? so it doesn't start uh, when the system system uh, starts. Uh, domain set credentials. We we basically have um, the enterprise uh, identity uh, management, right? So we can get a Windows system to join a domain or leave a domain. Right? We can do very simple, basic uh, domain objects uh, management. Um, so this allows us to create a domain. Right. Um, this allows you to add a uh, domain user, for instance. Right. Um, let me just run the YouTube video in this case.
Let me just change it. Yeah, okay. So I'll start again. So over here at this video, what I have is that I have a uh, 2012 uh, Windows that is running in uh, vCenter. Uh, it has a dot, um, 51 IP address. So this is my um, AD. Uh, you will see that this is an older version of Windows. I did this a while back. I mean, sorry, uh, Ansible Tower. The GUI interface is a bit different. So I have, again, my group and my um, host, um, because it was done a while back, right? So I'm using a Windows uh, 2012 R2. Uh, this is my AD. So I have Cabros for my AD. These are the different templates that we have, right? So over here, I am... Um, using it to add a Windows um, user. So I'm defining where my AD server is, uh, which domain group, um, you know, where is the scope, the username, uh, myself, right? And this is my name um, and the password uh, that I will specify. And this is my uh, email. So basically, you will go and create uh, that particular user. So if you go back to the AD and you do a refresh, you will be able to see uh, this DevOps groups uh, as well as uh, me as a user, right? So this is whatever that we key in. So it shows that we can quite easily uh, manage uh, all these uh, users as well. I'm just closing my access to the uh, AD. And then I just want to show that the dot fifty one, which is the server, I can come in as uh, the new user, right? So it may, it's mainly just to show that you know everything is uh, working as expected. Uh, you can use um, Ansible to quite easily manage all these uh, different systems uh, without much issue. But right? it's not just about things like patch management or you know hardening. We can we can also quite easily um, do configuration changes like getting the system to join domain or creating new new users. Uh, as a trial, All right? So, I'm going back to my AD. I mean, that was for a single user. I'm trying to show that um, I can do multiple users as well, right? So I have a file that I have inside um, the Git repository, whereby what I'm doing is that I'm just saying that, see, I can I can create multiple um, users just by feeding it with a file so that, uh, you know, you can just create users with those kind of default password and after that you can force it to change a password. I think some of those things are what uh, some of my customers wanted to see so that uh, I just uh, did it uh, for them. All right, so it will just go and run this playbook that will just go and uh, do multiple user creation, right, just to show that we can create uh, all these uh, different users uh, at the same time, right? We don't have to um, really um, do too many things. So these are the dev team, right? The group, the QA, um, that was created. If you look at it, you have like Donald, Jack, James, um, Mickey being uh, created, right? So, um, yeah, th those are just some of the stuff that that we have. And that uh, the option that we set is that the user must change the password at the uh, next logon. So all those things are stuff that uh, you know maybe a normal system admin will be doing, and that we actually uh, show that it can be done uh, quite easily using automation and that we can do it on a very large um, scale as well, right? So 
large number of servers uh, we can manage, um, you know, creation of users. Why would that be something that people might want to do, right? It's because uh, sometimes um, you have external people coming in. So I understand from some customers that they have to delete and create users uh, quite frequently for temporary accounts for them to gain access into the system, perform a task. Uh, once they leave, they have to clean up. So it, even though it seems a bit um, easy to do, but because it's, they are doing it like a few times a day or you know quite frequently, they don't really like the idea that they have to go into all these systems every time to do all those stuff. And hence they were looking at automation to help them. Right, so this is one of those things that I was uh, showing them, you know, that can be quite easily achieved uh, when we do this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, okay. All right. And we have to refresh this thing. So um, we talk about a lot of things, right? So then how, how do we really uh, code this? So one of those challenges that I see some of my customers are facing is that uh, they are mostly system administrators, right? So they are not very used to the Linux uh, interface that uh, you know uh, we at Red Hat are quite used to, right? So all, all the Linux administrators are used to. So what can happen is that uh, you can actually make use of uh, tools like uh, Visual Studio, right? To help you to do uh, coding. I can see that everything over here is basically um, in a GUI format, and then you can use this to push uh, the codes uh, to GitLab, uh, where we keep track of all this uh, source code management. You get things like um, code completion, syntax highlighting, and um, you can even run playbooks uh, from here. Right. So uh, this is one way in which we tell our customers that uh, if you want to um, start this journey, right? You, you know, you don't really, really have to be a expert in Vim, you know, or Nano, right? You can quite easily make use of uh, IDE, like um, Visual Studio Code, to help you um, to do the uh, coding. To just a very simple illustration, right? I have it um, over here, right? So you can see that this is actually the um, Visual Studio Code that we have created. So you can type uh, here, right? I mean, this is similar to the example that we saw earlier, right? We we basically have an install IIS for this uh, web server. We start the service and then we create an index uh, website uh, for the, I mean, the index HTML for the website. Uh, and then we can just uh, show the website address. Um, and all these things will correspond to the codes that we checked into Git uh, lab, right? So it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. If there are any changes, you just click over here. This this is for your source code uh, management, right? You can commit, push a code. It will automatically get sent over to uh, the Git repository. And then over here from the uh, Ansible uh, itself, you will be able to um, you know, run the particular workflow, right? Like what we have done uh, in the past. And that this is basically the, the web page that we have. Right, so I just do a very simple string. I just set a welcome one two three, right? So that's the IS service that was running. So this this could be one way in which, um, or rather, we think that this is actually quite a good way in which uh, we can help uh, promote the usage of uh, Ansible through a very simple uh, way of uh, coding. Where you don't have to learn all the Linux stuff uh, in order for a system administrator to be able to use um, Ansible. Right, so. Yeah, I just wanted to show this uh, to show you that it, it's actually quite simple, right? You can all these things. Um, yeah, I mean, the last part really is that uh, as I mean, Windows is a first class citizen within the uh, Ansible ecosystem. We have uh, spent quite a fair bit of time, right, trying to work with, um, you know, obviously uh, Microsoft uh, as well as um, the other community users to promote this usage. Uh, and that we do see uh, quite a lot of traction, right? Uh, when it comes to having um, people to or customers to use uh, uh, Ansible for Windows, uh, of of course, right? Uh, it's mainly also because of the fact that Ansible can do a lot of different things, 
So we usually see it as uh, the way to break down the silos between the different teams and to gain this, uh, um, you know, um, automation using a single unified uh, platform, uh, which is Ansible Automation Platform, right, for all these uh, various departments uh, within the organization. And by being able to combine things like Windows, um, you know, Linux, Network, uh, the Unix, uh, storage, you know, container platform, whatever, right, all those things can all be uh, managed using Ansible. So this is just uh, one more area in which we think that uh, we can help. And the latest area that we are looking at is um, more towards the Ansible security automation space, right? So that again will also help to pull the security team, right, into this common platform that we are looking at. So we do believe that uh, having Ansible, right, as the common platform will help um, to gel all the different teams together uh, whether you are Windows administrator, Linux administrators, network administrators, or you know security analysts, uh, for instance, right? You can all come together and uh, use this uh, Ansible playbooks and workflow to do the stuff that you need to do. Um, I think I think that's about it that I wanted to share today. Um, yeah. All right, thank you very much, Anthony, for letting us know that Windows plus Ansible equals love. <laughs> and uh, it yes, looks like it <laughs> there's good interest on the security automation with Ansible and also on the actual customer use case. So we'll probably consider those on the next meetup that we have. So Michael has left us because he's uh, he has another uh, appointment, but. Thanks again, Anthony, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, that was really good demo. That gives us a good overview on how Ansible can really work well with Windows. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing more of you and more of those demos in the webinars for Red Hat. And uh, of course, thank you everyone for your time. Apologies that we extended a bit, but there's definitely worth uh, extending for all the information that Anthony has shared with us. So. Again, looking forward to seeing you on the next meetup this August. We will be talking about the Dark Tower. So make sure you um, um, join that meetup as well. And um, I think that's it for now. Um, Anthony, thank you again. Yeah, thank you guys uh, for attending. We'll see you again. And uh, yeah, have a great day, everyone. Yeah. Have a great day, guys. <laughs>